welcome class. Today we're going to discuss some political philosophy and its influence on our American government. Let's first talk about some historical context. So our country was formed during an era called the Age of Enlightenment. This is a really important moment in historical development. It occurred in the 1600s and 1700s, and it's significant mainly because of the great number of changes that occurred and how people thought about uh, life uh, and many other uh, topics. The Enlightenment was uh, a moment where uh, a lot of new uh, thought, new ideas, new information was coming to play, and it was a heavy influence on our founders, the people who sat down and actually designed how our government would work. So it's it's critical that you understand what the Enlightenment is all about and some important ideas that came out of it. Here's a rundown of kind of a before and after uh, considering the Enlightenment. Think back to when you studied world history. In the time prior to the Enlightenment, think the Middle Ages or anything earlier than that, most of what humans thought and did, acted upon, was based on really one of two things. You had either traditions, these, you know, it's just uh, the idea that we're going to do something in a certain way because that's the way we've always done it. And the other big influence on human action prior to the Enlightenment was people's religious beliefs. They, they based things on uh, stuff they read in the Bible or other religious teachings. Governments during this time had a certain particular shape. Tended to see more countries, more societies and states run by kings, run by monarchs, that really um, exercised a lot of power over their people and set things up mainly for the benefit of themselves. They wanted that kingdom to run in a way that made them happy. After the Enlightenment, you see these ideas start to change. The first thing that happens is people began to question uh, traditions, question older ways of thinking. They, they think critically about stuff. They look at things and say, yeah, we've been doing this this way this entire time, but is it necessarily the best way to behave? Also, reason and evidence begin to replace uh, religious beliefs. And this idea of humanism, that we need to value human beings just because they're human, starts to come into play. And this, of course, changes how people think about how governments should act. It's not like kingdoms and monarchies go away entirely during the Enlightenment, but you certainly begin to see more governments come into being that are responsive to the people, that emphasize democracy and emphasize rights that the people have. So now that you have a little bit of background and context into the era that we're talking about, let's begin to talk about some ideas. First idea I want to start us off with is this idea of the state of nature. The state of nature is a term that uh, philosophers use at this time to describe a condition of existence where you don't have a society. So what does that mean in plain language? It means that uh, kind of all of the the rules and norms and patterns of behavior and things that you have to do uh, because you exist in a society are, are no longer have to happen because your society either doesn't exist yet or has fallen away. So think about maybe what humans were like before we began to develop society and culture. Living out in nature, living out in the woods, and uh, just kind of focused on basic survival. Or you can also think about this as, you know, in like um, the ways that movies or TV shows depict like uh, apocalypse events and how people react to them once society goes away and people kind of have to make their own way again. So the state of nature is a unique place. And we're not very familiar with it because we are much more uh, familiar and comfortable with existing within a society. But if you think about the state of nature, you're living out in the woods, your survival is completely up to you, there are certain good things and certain bad things that come from that kind of existence. And the main good thing 
about living in a state of nature is that you get to enjoy complete freedom. Nobody is going to tell you what to do. There's no alarm clocks. There's no appointments. There's no bell schedule. You have complete freedom. The bad part is that everybody has complete freedom. Uh, and if somebody wants to uh, do something bad to you, uh, take your stuff, uh, harm your rights, uh, they have the freedom to do that. And really the only thing that's going to stop them is that if you're stronger than they are. So you can imagine that this life in the state of nature uh, can be, e even though you have uh, complete freedom, can be pretty chaotic. You have to be a strong individual in order to survive. This is not a way that many of us would like to live. So, uh, kind of according to the philosophers of the Enlightenment and other deep thinkers, humans make a decision to sort of get themselves out of this state of nature. And what they do is they form communities. They group up. They team up. Because you're always stronger when you're in a team got other people that you can lean on, you can rely on, they can watch your back, you can watch theirs. A team is going to be able to survive much more easily than just one person out there in the wilderness. But there's a difficulty to living in a community, and that is once you get around other people, you start to run into situations where um, you know, conflict can arise and unless you've got some rules to shape behavior. When you're around other people, you've got to follow guidelines to kind of keep your interactions with one another in a, a, a positive and healthy place. So what do we do? We come to an agreement. And this agreement is called the social contract. <laughs> in technical terms, the social contract, the idea is written right over here the idea that people and their government come to an agreement and they help society function in an effective way. Let's look at how two important philosophers thought about this idea. The first one that we're going to talk about is a guy named Thomas Hobbes. Here's Thomas Hobbes. As you can tell from how he looks, he existed quite a while ago. Uh, but his uh, ideas are, are still important and um, they have an impact on us even today. Just a little bit about his background. He was from England. He lived in the 1600s, and he witnessed a particularly uh, nasty moment in history called the English Civil War. And you don't need to remember too many details about the English Civil War, but you can tell just by the, just by the name. You know, this was a civil war. It meant that people in England were essentially fighting their neighbors. You can imagine kind of some of the, the rough, uh, nasty events that, that came out of this war where neighbors were fighting neighbors and people were killing one another. Well, when Thomas Hobbes saw events like this happen, it, it caused him to, to shape his beliefs about humanity and what humans were really like in a very profound way. Thomas Hobbes believed that humans by their nature were evil, and that if you left people to their own devices, in other words, if you didn't control them strongly, they would behave badly. Therefore, what humans needed in order for a society to function was some outside force to control them. So here's what his ideal government looks like. There is this agreement, this social contract, that exists between the people and a strong authoritarian leader or government that has absolute power over their behavior. His belief was that uh, unless this government was strong and could control people's actions and could control people's behavior, the society would, would disintegrate because people would just do evil things. On the other hand, we have another philosopher whose name is John Locke. He had a different take on all of this. Notice that he's also from England. He's also from the 1600s. But he witnessed a different moment in history. He came along a couple decades after Thomas Hobbes. He saw a moment in English history called the Glorious Revolution. And this was a time when the leadership in England changed hands in a very peaceful way. 
There were no great wars happening in England to bring about change, even though change was happening. So he saw some positive behavior, and that led him to a much more positive belief in what human beings were like. He thought that people in the state of nature were good. He also thought that people had certain rights. And his short list of natural rights should hopefully be familiar to you. Life, liberty, property. Those were his idea, his ideas of uh, basic rights that we are born with as humans. We have the right to live, we have the right to be free, and we have the right to own stuff. So according to him, uh, his view of an ideal government also revolved around this idea of a social contract, but it was a little bit different than Hobbes. In his social contract, in his agreement, the government promised to protect people's rights. And in exchange for that protection, people promised to follow the laws that were instituted by the government. And he added something else. If the government became corrupt, started to neglect its job in protecting people's rights, the people could overthrow the government and start all over. So you have two different views on how a social contract can work and shape a society. There's two other philosophers that I want to discuss. First is Montesquieu. Montesquieu uh, is from France. He's from the early 1700s. He had some beliefs that impacted uh, our government and the way that it took shape in, in a very precise way. He um, thought that government needed to be structured in a way that would prevent the government from becoming tyrannical. In other words, from it taking over complete control. And his belief was that the best way to do this was to take the powers of government and separate them out into branches. He suggested that we have three branches of government, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And I'm certain that you can see exactly how this played into the design and the shape that our government took. The final philosopher is a man named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He is uh, another person from Europe. He's from Switzerland, France, also from the 1700s. He had uh, certain ideas about people and the freedom that we get to enjoy. His belief was that um, people should be able to live in freedom but also enjoy uh, peace and order. He wanted uh, government to involve a situation where all people were considered equal. The communities got to establish their own rules democratically. We're going to, um, in lessons to come, look at precisely how these philosophers' ideas uh, shaped different aspects of our government. So make sure that you can remember what these guys thought about, wrote about their ideas, and uh, maybe be thinking about ways that they connect to how our government does things even today.